Good afternoon, uh, dear Ambassador of Nicaragua to the United Kingdom, uh, Giselle Morales. Uh, dear participants, uh, dear audience, welcome to Instituto Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds uh, to celebrate what is the main activity of Ruben Darío Month, which we have programmed together with the Embassy of Nicaragua in the United Kingdom and with the collaboration of the Sherman Books. First of all, I would like uh, to uh, thank the Nicaraguan ambassador, Isel Morales, and the participants this evening, the translator, Adam Feinstein, the actress, Maria Emendet, and the professors, Carlos Grimsey and Antonio Martinez Arboleda for the support, which has made it possible for us to present the book Ruben Darío Selected Poems, which has been translated by the Hispanist uh, Adam Feinstein and published by Sherman Books. A translation into English of the work of a Nicaraguan poem as a benchmark of the universal literature. It was precisely uh, the presentation of this magnificent book that inspired us to develop a more ambitious program and dedicate the whole month of January to the works and poetry of Ruben Darío. We have already shown uh, the work of Laura Hoffmans, the documentary Tierras Solares, and in the next two weeks, we will, on the 26th of January, we will have a reading club with Liverpool University professor Diana Kulel. And to finish this program on the 29th of January, we will have also a children's literature session with a reading from, uh, by the writer Claire Colefort, also the Nicaraguan ambassador Gil, uh, Giselle Morales uh, and Adam Feinstein will read. And Adam Feinstein had also translated, especially for this occasion, some stories for ch children from Ruben Darío. Ruben Darío, as you might know, was born in the city of uh, San Pedro de Metapa in Nicaragua and is the leading representative of the modernism, modernismo in Spanish language, the so-called Príncipe de las Letras. He was a diplomat, a traveler who took his poetry to America and Europe with an important stay in Spain where he came to rest and to recover from an, uh, health problems. And in this period in Spain, in Southern Spain, in Sevilla, he uh, also came to the contact to the people and he made a big impression also in the works of Ruben Darío. During that time, he was very important also, a figure for a group of young writers who were beginning their careers at the moment and uh, that emerged as one, uh, some of the most important writers of the Spanish literature. Among others, Juan Ramón Jiménez, Jacinto Benavente, or Ramón María del Valle Inclán. This value of uh, Rubén Darío as teaching of his poetry and influence in other authors has been universally recognized by such outstanding figures like uh, the novel uh, Paz, Octavio Paz, Borges, Neruda, and many others. It will now very briefly uh, introduce the participants in this evening. Adam Feinstein uh, is a British Hispanist with a long and prolific uh, career. His publications uh, include the biography Pablo Neruda, A Passion for Life, as well as translations of Neruda's Canto General, poems by Garcia Lorca and Mario Benedetti, among others, which have been published in important journals such as PN Review, Agenda, and Modern Poetry Translation. The book who, which we are presenting tonight is also not working 
for the complexity of the translation, something he will expose and discuss about later. He is currently at the moment working on the first English translation of the Mario Benedetti's novel in verse, El Cumpleaños del Ángel. Our second uh, guest is Carlos Gripsi, is a Nicaraguan academic with a PhD in Spanish American literature from Oxford University. His uh, um, thesis work was on the translation of Ruben Darío into English, published under the title Rediscovering Ruben Darío Through Translations. It should be also noted that uh, as a poet, uh, Grisby uh, won the 20th Pre uh, Premio Internacional de Poesía uh, jo de Creación Joven, Fundación Loewe, in 2007 for his collection, Una Oscuridad Brillando en la Claridad, que la claridad no logra comprender. And I will try to translate in English. A darkness shining in the clarity that the clarity fails to understand. The third guest is Antonio Martinez Arboleda, who is professor of Spanish uh, in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in the at the University of Leeds, where he is co-director of the University Center for Research in Digital Education. Arboleda is a poet also and who also leads the project La Cratera de Artemis. And as a translator, he collaborates with the magazine Cratera, being the United Kingdom delegate for this uh, prestigious publication. And the fourth guest, Maria Estevez, is an actress, poet, and playwright who lives between Spain and Great Britain. Her tribute to Federico García Lorca, Verde, Agua y Luna, has been awarded Best Theatre Production and uh, Rummer Up for the performance the Latin American United Kingdom Awards. I now hand over the, to the Her Excellency Giselle Morales, Ambassador uh, of Nicaragua to the United Kingdom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Um, excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, friends all. Thank you to all for your presence. Um, especially thank you to Pedro Jesus the director of Cervantes of Manchester and Leeds for dedicating this month a series of events to celebrate the natal anniversary of Ruben Darío, the poet, the prince of the Spanish letters who was born in Nicaragua 154 years ago. A genius that influenced the Hispanic poetry in the 20th century, a lead, leading the Spanish American literature literary movement known as modernism. Modernismo. Thank you for joining us in paying tribute to Darío, el libertador de la lengua, the liberator of the language, as Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian author, called him, launching the book Rubén Darío Selected Poems, masterfully translated by the well-known Hispanist writer, poet, and above all, a good friend, Professor Adam Feinstein. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to Scherzman Books for the publication for his verse of, of his verses in the language of Shakespeare. Despite of the difficult times the world is living, of, or perhaps because of the sober days we live, they continue to they continue publishing poetry. What a better day to celebrate Darío that to have a group of intellectuals, to have a Carlos Rigsby and an Antonio Martinez Arboleda, educators, professors, cultural activists, poets both, both passionate about Spanish literature and in love with Ruben Darío, joining Adam to talk about the life and work and the challenge of translating Ruben Darío, 
of taking to readers not only the poet's verses, but also his passion, his rebellion, and imagination. The crazy challenges of translating the mestizo poet, that, is that strange being pre-Columbian idol, as Octavio Paz called him once, that strange tropical bird, poet and prophet, respecting his rhyme, rhythm, and Alma of Darío's poems. But Rubén was not just another poet. He was also a diplomat, a pacifist, a journalist. According to the National Constitution of Nicaragua, he is a prosser of the cultural independence of the nation. And in March 2016, the 927 law declared Darío national hero. And in every corner of our country, he is revered as such because of he is the essence of the identity of our people, cheerful, brave, passionate, proud, and vibrant. With his pen and intellect, he defend the cultural sovereignty of the homeland. His prose and poetry express his faith in life. He gave a special tint to the blue of our skies, our lakes, and our flag. That's what the preamble of the, of the Constitution says about Darío. On January 11, in his message to the Nicaraguan families, President Daniel Ortega cited Rubén Darío forcefully and consistently, demonstrating the validity of his political reflections, not only for Nicaragua, but also for Nuestra America. Darío wrote in his time, wrote in his time about our continent, but his analysis and perspective could be used for our time. As Pedro mentioned, to celebrate his life uh, because his writings, prose and poetry was his life. His love for Hispano America was his life. To the continued evolution of his work and search for peace was his life. The Cervantes Darío Mon started with the screening of the documentary film uh, Tierra Solares, Solar Lands, from the Andalusian filmmaker Laura Hoffman, that portrays the journey of the poet in search of light and sun, the beauty and warmth of Andalusia, Tierras del Sol. Um, then uh, we will have uh, on 26 the, uh, uh, the reading session. And then we will have Darío for Kids, a storytelling on the 29th with Claire Clurifor, a uh, writer. In her introduction to the film, Hotman said, not only does value the figure the, of Rubén Darío, it also goes about his search for beauty, his defense of art, creation, poetry, imagination, also of the values of the society of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, marked by increasing industrialization, where that immaterial beauty began to have no place, a time very similar to the present one. By launching a poetry book, particularly, but launching a poetry book, particularly a translation of one of the greatest creators of the poetic language in Spanish, as recognized by, by Neruda, cannot be complete without reading the verses of what he called the poet of the America and Spain. Today, we are privileged to have Maria Esteves Serrano with us, well-known actress, and Adam painted himself reading the poetry of the maestro. My gratitude to you, Maria. Thank you very much. Since we are in Cervantes' home, I want to close with the words of Lorca at the homage uh, he and Neruda, him and Neruda, pay to Rubén Darío, known as Discurso a la Limón. Uh, I am going to read it in Spanish, and forgive me for my in attempt to say it in English in benefit of the English speaking. Um, or may, perhaps I should leave it for Adam to, to do it. 
como poeta español enseño en España a los viejos maestros y a los niños con un sentido de universalidad y de generosidad que hace falta en los poetas actuales. Enseñó a Valle Inclán y a Juan Ramón Jiménez y a los hermanos Machado y su voz fue agua y salitre en el surco del venerable idioma. Desde Rodrigo Caro a los Argensolas o Don Juan Arguijo, no había tenido el español fiestas de palabras, choques de consonantes, luces y forma como en Rubén Darío. Desde el paisaje de Velázquez a la hoguera de Goya y desde la melancolía de Quevedo al culto, al culto color manzana de las payesas mallorquinas, Darío paseó la tierra de España como su propia tierra. As a Spanish poet, he thought the old masters and children in Spain with a sense of universality and generosity that is lacking in today's poet. He thought by Inclan and Juan Ramon Jimenez and the Machado brothers and his voice was water and salt better. In the growth of the venerable language, from Rodrigo Caro to the Argensolas, or Don Juan Arguijo, Spanish had not had seen festivals of words, collisions of consonants, lights and form as in Rubén Darío. From the landscape of Velázquez and the bonfire of Goya, and from the melancholy of Quevedo and the apple colored coat of the Mallorcan, peasant woman, Darío toured the land of Spain as his own land. Thank you. I will pass now the floor to Antonio. Thank you to all. Thank you so much, Excellency um, Giselle Morales, Ambassador of Nicaragua in London. And thank you very much as well to Pedro Eusebio Cuesta, Director of the Cervantes Institute in Manchester and Leeds, an institution that we at the University of Leeds have a special a partnership with, and we're very proud of our links. And, uh, you know, um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm sure many of you, at least some of you, are readers of uh, poetry. And, uh, well, apart from reading poetry and enjoying poems, there are many other ways of engaging with poetry, performing poetry, reflecting academically upon poetry, translating poetry, these other modes of engagement with poetry require always a very intimate conversation with the poem and with the poet. Today, we're going to approach the figure and the work of uh, Rubén Darío from these three angles, performance, academic critique, and translation, trying to reach high levels of intimacy uh, with poetry yeah, through these three angles. But Typically, intimacy and light mm, appear, tend to appear as opposites. Not today, forget that cultural convention. Mm. Today, intimacy and light and clarity will not be incompatible. We'll do our best uh, to make this event enjoyable and accessible to everybody. And um, to help us in this quest, we have three specialists, three important people, Maria Estevez Serrano, Carlos Fonseca Gripsby, and um, uh, last but not least, uh, Adam Feinstein, whose book, Selected Poems, uh, we are launching today. And um, when you present a book, there's always a danger of uh, somehow spilling the beans. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. There will not be spoiler alerts today uh, of this book, and there will not be any beans um, spilled because there are no beans in this book. This book is a little chest, uh, treasure chest um, uh, with jewels. Yeah? If anything, the audience, you, may, may be able to see some of the brilliance, uh, some of the shining of those jewels in the book, but we promise not to spill the jewels, never mind the beans. Um, and I'm going to start um, with uh, asking a few questions uh, 
to Adam, and I think it's it's uh, it's necessary to start talking about Ruben Darío's persona. Adam, thank you very much for being here. Um, and I read your book; I really love it. Um, and I wanted to ask you something about the the character, the persona of um, of Ruben Darío. One of the things that strikes me about about his his life is that from very young age, a lot of important people wanted to bring Ruben Darío, you know, under their wings. You know, what did he have that everybody wanted to be so closely associated to him, you know, since that early, early age, Adam? Thank you. Well, good evening and thank you, first of all, Antonio, for those kind words, for the introduction. Um, yes, the, the persona of Darío is what fascinated me fascinates me as, almost as much as the, as the poetry um, and the prose. I'm glad Giselle mentioned the prose because he was, um, Dario is a wonderful prose writer. Not just his cuentos, his, his stories, but his journalism are magnificent. Uh, but um, Dario, he was born in, in 1867. His, his, his parents were separated, so he was very young. So he went to live with his, un his uncle and aunt. Um, and his uncle died and that threw the family into turmoil and then uh, but he started he learned to, to read write and re read and write uh, Rubin at about three very young and people very early on started to recognize his genius and you're right they tried to take him under their wing uh, presidents tried to take him under their wing uh, journalists top editors from papers from Central America tried to say come here come here Rubin and you know what the thing is he was very independent minded. He was very in, he was an indomitable spirit. He didn't want to be uh, uh, under the, the, com the control of anybody. And so from a very early age, he would write these uh, political articles, which got him into trouble. Uh, people don't realize this, that uh, they got him into trouble very early on, and they got him noticed as well. But then of course he, he, um, he, 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 he published a tool in Chilean in 1888. And that was the book that really got him uh, uh, noticed for the first time. But I'd like to draw attention to something that really strikes me about that year, which is his, his, his complexity, his, the, inner, um, the inner contradictions and tensions within him, which is what makes him such a, 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 a lively and such a modern poet to read today. Because think. in him you have the traditional, uh, you have the traditional, uh, but you also have the, the revolution, and you have the, the the spiritual poet, but also the uh, the erotic poet. You have uh, the poet of hope, but the poet of despair, and you also find a lot of this in the same one and the same poem. It's a remarkable thing, and um, it was a poem we were going to read, but I don't think we we'll have time. Which is very early on, people make a false distinction. They, they divide his work up into a before and after. They say, Rubin Darío, he started very grandiloquent, very romantic, very lyrical, and then he became this colloquial poet. Not true at all. He was, too, he was many, many Darios in one. So in his very first book, called Epistolas y Poemas, published in 1885, there's, there's a and that's the first translation in my book, in fact. Uh, he wrote a, a long poem called Echiomo, and it's in it he's actually demolishing or demolishing all the all the tropes, all the, the romantic tropes. He's, he's saying, I'm, I don't want to fall into the trap. I don't want, I'm not going to be a dogmatic poet and fall into any of these. Uh, and so, you know, it starts off always the same dawn lighting up the east. Today, yesterday, tomorrow, again, always bathed in white light, the same wretched visual feast, the same pearls, the same burgundy red. So he's making fun immediately of some of the tropes that, he, that people make, people say he was a master of. Um, he, he could do everything. He could, he could write in any tone he liked, and that was what makes him such an approachable, an approachable and marvelously rich poet. Um, and so I don't know whether Carlos has anything to, to add to yeah. that. Thank you, Ad thank you, Adam. Uh, we also have Dr. Carlos Griffey. Um, Carlos, would you like to add uh, any words to, to what Adam just said now about the, the persona of uh, Ruben Darío? 
Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Antonio. I think that, I mean, Dario is, is a fascinating character and really to put him into context, we have to think that he was born in Nicaragua in, in mid 19th century. Um, and today Nicaragua is still like a very poor country, despite being having a very strong literary tradition. But back then it's very hard to picture what Metapa might have looked like or might have been um, in 1867 or 1868 when Darío was born. Um, but despite that, you know, he became very famous when he was eight or nine. He started publishing his poems and he was known as the El Poeta Niño or the child poet. Um, and then he traveled to, to Chile, he traveled to Argentina, he lived in Spain, he lived in Paris, um, several places in Spain. And, and the result of that is that he is an essential chapter in the literary history of each of these countries. Um, so there's a, a strong modernista movement in Chile after Darío. Um, in Argentina, he starts kind of modern literary movement there. He introduces the short story as well. And as the ambassador and the director of the Cervantes Institute have already pointed out, in Spain, he's absolutely key for a kind of literary renewal um, that'll open the door for, for writers afterwards. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, he's, he's extraordinary, extraordinary character, completely unpredict unpredictable um, if you look at the, the time and context. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, uh, I have a curiosity. Um, some of you may, may know a little bit about the life of Ruben Darío. Uh, just briefly, could uh, you please tell me about the following? Uh, Ruben Darío was a man surrounded by highly educated people, influential people. He was a man of high culture, but in 1899, he met Francisca Sanchez del Pozo, who was a, a lady from a, a very rural environment in the province of Avila, a, a woman who couldn't read or write. How was this uh, love um, between them? How, how did uh, Ruben Darío, you know, uh, fall in love with a woman um, who could not read, who could not write, who was a peasant, if he was, uh, you know, a highly educated person, you know, surrounded by highly educated and influential people. Could, could, is there an explanation for that? Yes, that, that's a very good question. I, I'm, I, it's, a, it's a profoundly moving relationship. The relationship with Francisca Sanchez. As you say, she was a daughter of a gardener, that you met her, met her by chance, and uh, he, she couldn't write, read or write. He taught her to read and write, and then she started writing these very moving love letters to him. Now, uh, Laura Ochman's uh, wonderful documentary, which we saw the other day, Tierra Solare, which I love. Um, it, it says a lot about what Francisca saw in Darío as the genius, this great man of letters, but also a, a great lover, a great a passionate lover. It doesn't, the film, I don't think, said much about what, what attracted Darío to Francisca, even though uh, we heard in the film from Francisca's granddaughter, because un unbelievably her, her granddaughter is still alive. It's, it's almost impossible to uh, contemplate, but uh, Francisca's granddaughter is still alive. Um, so, uh, but I think um, it was her innocence. I think it was Francisca's innocence. It was the fact that she was the opposite, in totally the opposite of what, uh, of, of these ac intellectuals and academics and uh, journalists that, that he was used to meeting with. And she was simple, she was passionate, she was uh -huh. affectionate without without any intellect, intellectual uh, trappings. Mm -hmm. That's what um, attracted to him. I also think there was a, um, something of the fact that he could mold her, but I don't mean that uh, uh, in a way that would offend the feminists. You know, that he would mold her, Francisco, in, his, in an image he wanted. Not at all, I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, that he could, he could be with someone he loved, and he could see her flourishing, see her grow with him. Mm -hmm. I think he, he found that very attractive, very alluring. It's uh, a remarkable relation. But I think we're going to read, yeah. uh, 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 which is why I've chosen the poem that um, Dario wrote to 
a son that he had with Francisca. Utfuka, he, he named he named him Fokash. Fokash, um, which is uh, if I call, the poem is called Fokash in Campesino, uh, and I call I, the title is often uh, uh, given as Fokash the peasant. I do not like that title at all. First of all, peasant can be condescending. Secondly, I much prefer my title, which is Fokash the country boy, because Fokash was raised in the country by Francisca's relatives. And that's, so I think that's uh, uh, much more important. Um, he had a Thank tragically you. short life. Uh, he died of bronchial pneumonia before the age of three uh, in 1905. So let's jump. Uh, I yeah. think we're going to so, have... Uh, yeah, we Maria. give, way, we give way to Maria. Maria is going to read. Maria Estevez is going to read this, uh, this poem. Adelante, Maria. Gracias, Antonio. A Focas el campesino. Focas el campesino, hijo mío, que tienes en apenas escasos meses de vida tantos dolores en tus ojos que esperan tantos llantos. Por el fatal pensar que revelan tus sienes, tarda a venir a este dolor a donde vienes, a este mundo terrible en duelos y en espantos. Duerme bajo los ángeles, sueña bajo los santos, que ya tendrás la vida para que te envenenes. Sueña, hijo mío, todavía, y cuando crezcas, perdóname el fatal don de darte la vida que yo hubiera querido de azul y rosas frescas. Pues tú eres la crisálida de mi alma entristecida, y te he de ver en medio del triunfo que merezcas, renovando el fulgor de mi psique abolida. To Fokas, the country boy. Fokas, the country boy, my only son. In so few months of life, your eyes show the first suffering and the tears of the wise. Your temples throb with thoughts of the years to come. Don't rush into sorrow towards this noisome world of shock and hateful pain. Sleep in the care of angels and saints. There's plenty of time for life's sour poison. Keep dreaming, my son. And when you are a man, forgive me for gifting you this doom-laced life. It should have smelled blue as fresh roses can. For you are the chrysalis of my saddened soul. At least I'll see your triumphs so richly deserved and my spirit brightens, reborn from the year's dread toll. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, now about the, the translations. I have read, I have read the translations, well done, very enjoyable. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions, and these questions are for you and also for Carlos, if, if he wants to say something as well. Um, for those members of the audience who may not be familiar with poetry translation, what is different when it comes to translating poetry if you compare it with other literary or non-literary texts? And also, another question, uh, what specific challenges were there with translating uh, Ruben Darío. So two questions in one uh, for both of you, Adam and Carlos. Okay, so first of all, my mother, Elaine Feinstein, was a very famous poet who died uh, in nine, uh, 2019. And she always told me, growing up in Cambridge, all great poems must sing. They must be musical. Otherwise, they're not great poems. Now, in general, I, I think it's, it, it's fair to say, certainly in nonfiction, I, I, it, I'm, I'm exaggerating and generalizing, but it doesn't, it doesn't sing. Of course, prose can be very elegant, both nonfiction and fiction. It's, uh, Garcia Marquez's novel is wonderfully elegant and beautifully written but poetry must sound like music. I agree with my mother entirely. I never disagree with my mother, you know that. You never disagree with your mother. You must, it's bad, it's bad form. 
and she knew what she was talking about. So when I write poems myself, I try and make them sing. And of course, in, with Darío, it's especially true, because that's one of the things that modernismo brought with it. It brought with it uh, this new revolutionary uh, musical singing, uh, rhythmical, a different rhythm, different beat, uh, which made it sing out and sound just so different from anything that happened before. And that's why I chose, I made the, the pioneering decision to translate that into rhyme in English. Nobody has published a whole book of rhyming translations of Dario before. It, uh, nobody has been so foolish so, or so foolhardy or so brave, whatever you like to say. And the reason is, it, it actually stemmed from a comment that Dario made in the prologue to um, his book, Cosas Profanas, when he said, Cada palabra tiene un alma. Every word has a soul. So what I'm trying to do is to rescue that soul. I preserve the soul of Dario in, um, in, with rhyme. I'd just like I can very quickly give one small example, a specific example. I think this might be very interesting to the audience. It's a poem we're not going to read. It's one of his, Dario's most famous poems, Sonatina, which begins, of course, La Princesa está triste que tiene la princesa. We're not going to read that, but I just want to read two lines where I had to reverse, I had to be very free to, to maintain the rhyme. I had to reverse the, or, the word order. In Spanish, the, the, the lines are piensa caso en el príncipe de Golconda y de China, o de China, o en el que ha detenido su carroza argentina. Now the problem with that in English is China, Argentina, Argentina doesn't rhyme with China. So I have there's no way I can repeat that line. So what I did was I moved Golconda to the end of the line. And so my translation is, is she thinking of princes in China or Golconda, of one who stopped his silver carriage to ponder? And the way, so I've kept, I've maintained the rhyme um, I, by liberally, uh, um, freely, reversing the order. I think I'm justified. What's more, I think Dario wouldn't have minded because he was so revolutionary in his use of language and meter and breaking lines and changing orders that he, I don't think if I had him on behind me on my, on my, over my shoulder, he would have said, okay, Adam, I, I think I know what you did there. I think I know what you did there. Not bad, not bad. So uh, that was just a specific example. Probably. Fantastic. Um... Yeah, I'm a, I, I myself like your approach very much personally. I, I remember somebody was criticizing, you know, nicely one of my poems because I had rhymes and I said, when the rhyme of the verse is nothing but the echo of its truth, let it be, poet, let it be. In Spanish was, uh, cuando la rima del verso no es más que un eco de su verdad, no lo calles, poeta, no lo calles. So uh, we have, um, we have, um, perhaps Carlos wants to say something about this as well, the uh, challenges of poetry, translation, and what is specifically challenging and interesting about translating uh, Ruben Darío. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we could, we could talk about it at, at length. <laughs> I just give one small example to complement um, what, what Adam just said. And it's in relation to something that, that Nabokov, Vladimir Nabokov, the Russian-American writer, um, said once when he started out translating poetry um, from Russian into English and vice versa before he became famous as, as a writer of Lolita and so on. Um, he was trying to translate, I think, a verse by a, a line of Tennyson that says, um, those blue remembered hills. And, and the problem that he encountered in doing so is that blue in Russian has no connotation of melancholy or nostalgia or sadness. So if he would translate that literally into Russian, blue wouldn't mean anything. It would be a gratuitous color there. So I think the, the great difficulty and the, the distinction between translating prose and poetry, though this obviously overgeneralizes a bit, but, but it still, I think, remains true, 
is that you're working at the level of suggestion, connotation, association, ambiguity. Um, and that's not always on the surface of the page, but you have to read in between the lines. Um, and this is just, I think, exacerbated in a poet as, as rich and, and musical as Dario is. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Adam, I believe that now, according to my script, yeah. uh, Maria, Maria is going to read La Pagina Blanca. Could you tell us yeah. why you have chosen this one? Thank you very much. That was, you know, actually, that's a sort of addendum to my, my last answer, which is that uh, Dario also uses half rhyme, media rima, in some of his poems. And this is a great example we've got to hear, which is La Pagina Blanca, the blank page. Now, this is an extraordinary poem about uh, an experience that all of us writers have when we sit down to read, to, 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 to write something, and the white page stares out at us, and we haven't got a clue what to cover it with. And um, of course, he was, Dario was very impressed by the, the French symbolist poet Stéphane Malarmé who wrote a very famous poem called La Brise Marine. La Brise Marine, which starts La Chère et Triste et la le Livre. It's all about the same experience of the blank page. When Malarmé died, Rubin Daniel wrote a, a, an obituary where he talked about uh, Malarmé's uh, ability to conjure up the music of words. So it's very fitting. Now in this, in this, in my translation of La Pagina Blanca, as you'll see, I've kept the half rhyme as much as possible in my English translation. Not only that, you'll see that I've repeated some of the words. There are lots of repetitions. Now you might think, oh, I should have tidied it up. Some people might argue, oh, it's a bit clumsy. Sounds a bit clunky in English. No, not at all, because what he's describing is that state we writers get into of uh, dreamlike repetition of words going through our head is precisely because we don't know anything. We can't think of a new one. We can't think of a, a, a better one. And so it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant poem for that reason, for capturing the, the frustration, the tensions of being a writer and not knowing what to help to fill the paper. So uh, let's, let's hear the poem now. Yes, adelante, Maria. Gracias, Antonio. <clears throat> La Pagina Blanca. Mis ojos miraban en hora de ensueños la página blanca y vino el desfile de ensueños y sombras y fueron mujeres de rostros de estatua, mujeres de rostros de estatua de mármol tan tristes, tan dulces, tan suaves, tan pálidas y fueron visiones de extraños poemas, de extraños poemas de besos y lágrimas, de historias que dejan en crueles instantes las testas viriles cubiertas de canas. Qué cascos de nieve que pone la suerte, qué arrugas precoces cincela en la cara y cómo se quiere que vayan ligeros los tardos camellos de la caravana. Los tardos camellos, como las figuras en un panorama, cual si fuesen un desierto de hielo, atraviesan la página blanca. Este lleva una carga de dolores y angustias antiguas. Angustias de pueblos, dolores de razas, dolores y angustias que sufren los cristos que vienen al mundo de víctimas trágicas. Otro lleva en la espalda el cofre de ensueños, de perlas y oro que conduce la reina de Saba. Otro lleva una caja en que va dolorosa difunta como un muerto lirio la pobre esperanza. Y camina sobre un dromedario la pálida, la vestida de ropas oscuras la reina invencible, la bella inviolada, la muerte. Y el hombre, a quien duras visiones asaltan, el que encuentra en los astros del cielo prodigios que abruman y signos que espantan, mira al dromedario de la caravana como al mensajero que la luz conduce en el vago desierto que forma la página blanca. The Black Page. In the daydreaming hours, my eyes stared at the blank page. Then came the procession of fantasies and shadows, women with statue faces, women with faces of marble statues, so sad, so sweet, so soft, so pallid. There were visions of the strangest poems, strange poems of kisses and tears 
stories full of cruel episodes that leave virile young men with grey hair around the ears. Fate drifts by with heavy helmets of snow, leaving foreheads chiseled with early wrinkles. You can't expect camels, so sluggish and slow, to join the caravan with a skip and a jiggle. Yes, sluggish camels, like figures in a landscape, ambling as if in a desert of ice across the blank page. This one bears the burden of sorrow and ancient anguish, the anguish of nations, the sorrows of races, that same sorrow and anguish borne by Christ figures who know how tragic fate is. The next one bears a coffer of dreams, or the golden pearls of the Queen of Sheba. The next one bears a coffin, and in it the desolate deceit, poor hope lying there still as a dead lily. And there, Mounted on a dromedary, she rides, pallid, but dressed in her usual black, the invincible queen, beauty in violet, death. And the man, assailed by dreadful visions, battered by the messages he reads in the stars, terrifying omens and marvels that dazzle, glances at the dromedary in the caravan as if it's a messenger carrying the light through the hazy desert of the blank page. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam and Maria. Um, I'm going to ask now, um, I'm going to move on um, with a question uh, directly to Carlos, uh, Dr. Grisbeck. Uh, Carlos, um, Ruben Darío is considered the leading figure of uh, modernist poetry in Spanish, and he had many followers also in Spain, notably Juan Ramón Jiménez, who was a Nobel Prize in, in 1956. However, and the book of Adam also captures this, um, there was a huge literary dispute, if, if not a confrontation, uh, between modernismo and anti-modernism, uh, with some heavyweight, you know, writers, uh, Spanish writers taking, taking sides uh, with anti-modernismo. It was, you know, if we had to think about confrontation today, it was like Brexit against anti-Brexit or, you know, people in favor of Trump and people against Trump almost, you know, this confrontation between modernismo and anti-modernismo, you know, if, if you were, I mean, let's do a little bit of an exercise. Um, if you were back in time, Carlos, uh, and you had uh, to reply to the criticisms uh, of the anti-modernist camp, what would you say to the detractors of modernism and the detractors of, of, of Rubén Darío? Well, it's easy. I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's easy to respond that in hindsight, even if I um, carry out the exercise of transporting myself to the time. I, I, would, I would hope to say to them that they were being a bit close-minded um, and provincial in the way that they were reacting to these, to these new texts. I think what's, what Dario did at the time is, is kind of plug in or tap into um, a kind of cultural or literary conversation that was taking place um, throughout an international network that spanned the whole of the Americas and also bridged um, the Atlantic. And that had to do with um, certain literary and stylistic innovations um, that the symbolists in France were carrying out. Um, so Paris at that time, that's why Dario was so um, enamored with Paris. Paris was the kind of really the cultural capital and the kind of geographical nexus for this movement. Um, and what they were doing is using metaphors um, and, and, and in a very innovative way that included synesthesia and mixing um, different sensations and experimenting that um, with that on the page. Um, and also trying to divest the meaning of a literary text from its moral meaning. Um, and so at the turn of the century, literature was mostly seen um, as, a, as an instrument of, of morality, as a way of teaching people to, to, to live better and so on and so forth. So this was very threatening for the literary establishment of the time. Um, and Dario, like you say, had many enemies, um, many very well-established enemies like Clarín in Spain hated Dario. Um, and there were many 
parodic exercises deriding the excesses or what were seen as the excesses of the modernistas. Um, but that was really, I think, that those, the kind of transposition of those innovations into Spanish, um, when you look at the texts that were written at the time are so like light years apart from the texts that the modernistas would then write, um, was absolutely key for, for what came afterwards. Fantastic. Uh, Adam, uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, very quickly, because I know we want to leave time for more poems. Yeah. But uh, I think it, this, this uh, dispute between the modernistas and anti-modernistas was in part due to complete misreading or misunderstanding of that year, or by people who hadn't read all of that year. So they hadn't read uh, books like Aborojos, which is, uh, which is delightfully ironic and satirical and witty. They fell into the trap of only clinging on to the, the, the symbol of the thesme and they wanted to the swan and they wanted to twist the neck of a swan and kill it off. They didn't realize that that, that, that com complexity that I talked about at the start of, the pro of this program for the evening, that, um, that he could be all things to all readers. He could, mm -hmm. be, he could be very, very simple. He could be very colloquial. And people, great poets made this mistake. You know, um, the Cuban poet, Gaston Barquero uh, and, Leo, and Luis Ternudo, the Spanish poet, they, they both condemned uh, the modernista, the, the supposedly the gandiloquent, over-romantic the, the poetry, the poetry of Sonatina. But then in the end, they came round. Mm. Both Barquero and Ternudo came round to realizing we can't do without that. Yeah. No Thank you. Can, can, can do without that poem, without that musical poetry. So, I think it's due to a mystery, um, a si oversimplification of that year. Thank you, uh, Carlos. One, um, you know, uh, uh, as a reader, um, uh, having having studied actually Ruben Darío at school, like we used to do at my age. You know, people of my age, we studied in, pr in secondary, in primary school, we studied Ruben Darío. When I read now Ruben Darío again, I find that some of the poems, you know, are very, you know, the, the type of writing is very similar to what many well-established writers in Spain and Latin America nowadays write. Why is it so contemporary, Ruben Darío? Why, when you read some of these poems written more than 100 years ago, they seem to be written, they could have been written by well-established authors today. Uh, is that the legacy of Darío, perhaps? Yeah, it's, I certainly think it's one of one of the aspects of his legacy. I think that, um, particularly in relation to, to Adam's translation, I think one of the great advantages of the selection of poems that Adam has has made for for his translation is that he he translated the whole gamut of Darío's many registers. Um, so I think that certainly a lot of what Darío wrote reads very contemporary, particularly the very early poems that Adam was just talking about that are wonderfully ironic, daring, irreverent, and so on, and also the late ones um, from El Canterrante and onwards. Um, a lot of those prefigure um, the, the subsequent poetry that would be written in Spanish. That said, I do think that a lot of it has aged poorly. Um, I think that that's one of the challenges of translating an author like Darío, who, as the ambassador reminded us at the beginning of the of the session, was born 150 years ago. Um, so that's almost inevitable at the same time. But I think there are, as, as Adam has said, there are many Daríos. They often contradict one another, which makes him so rich and so interesting as well. Um, and because of that vast and a broad, wide-ranging experimentation that you find in his work is that he's, he hit all the notes and he also continues to be contemporary. Mm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Adam, I think we are going to have now Maria again reading a, a fragment uh, of uh, Epistola, Epistola de la Señora Lugones. Would you like to say, to introduce the yeah, poem? Very, very briefly, very briefly. This is a wonderful poem. It's a long poem. It's a letter, but it's a letter written in such modern style. I mean, uh, the great uh, Uruguayan poet Mario Benedetti said it could have been written last week. Octavio Paz 
the great the Mexican, who was a who's a mile of Dario, of course, said he said it was uh, an undoubted uh, predecessor of what would be one of the conquests of contemporary poetry, the fusion of literary language and the language of the street. That's exactly what it is. And so you'll see when we read just this extract, I've had to take only a very short extract. You can read the whole poem in my book. Please do. But we're going to read just a short extract now. Epístola. Soy así. Se me puede burlar con calma. Es justo. Por eso los astutos, los listos, dicen que no conozco el valor del dinero. Lo sé. Que ando nefelibata por las nubes. Entiendo. Que no soy hombre práctico en la vida. Estupendo. Sí, lo confieso. Soy inútil. No trabajo por arrancar a otro su pitanza. No bajo a hacer la vida sórdida de ciertos previsores. Y no ahorro ni en seda, ni en champaña, ni en flores. No combino sutiles pequeñeces, ni quiero quitarle de la boca su pan al compañero. Me complace en los cuellos blancos ver los diamantes. Gusto de gentes de maneras elegantes y de finas palabras y de nobles ideas. Las gentes sin higiene ni urbanidad, de feas, trazas, avaros, torpes o malignos y rudos, mantienen, lo confieso, mis entusiasmos mudos. No conozco el valor del oro. Saben esos que tal dicen lo amargo del jugo de mis sesos, del sudor de mi alma, de mi sangre y mi tinta, del pensamiento en obra y de la idea en cinta? ¿He nacido yo acaso hijo de millonario? He tenido yo cirineo en mi calvario. Tal continué en París lo empezado en Anvers. Hoy, heme aquí en Mallorca, la terra del Sfoners, como dicemos en cinto el gran catalán. Y desde aquí, señora, mis versos a ti van, olorosos a sal marina y azares, al suave aliento de las Islas Baleares. That's me. Thank you. That's me, a swindling target for those who please. Those cleverer than me say when it comes to money that it slips through my hands, of course, like honey. That I'm a cloud walker, a dozy daydreamer. Sure thing. That I'm not a practical man. Well, ha, how shocking. I admit it, I'm useless. I don't work to steal a pit from some others like a jerk. I don't stoop to a life of sordid calculations, saving up silks or champagne or carnations. I don't hatch any petty schemes to grab the bread from out of the mouth of my pal. No, I like the sight of white necks with diamonds. Not the base taste, but elegant higher ones, people of wit. Grand ideas, nobility, not for me those with no hygiene or gentility. The ugly, the mean, the clumsy, coarse or malicious, I confess, I avoid them. It just seems judicious. So I don't know the value of gold. Can those who are saying these things conceive the bitter sap in my brain, the sweat in my soul, in my blood, in my ink? I heave with ideas. I bulge when I think. Don't imagine my father was a millionaire. Oh, no way. And my Calvary, no Simon or Simon there. So my life continued as it had in Antwerp. I'm now in Mallorca, known in the Catalan words of the great Mosin Cinto as the land of slingers. And from here, madame, these lines wing their way over land and water to you on the gentle Balearic breeze perfumed by orange blossom and salt seas. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to ask Carlos now. Carlos, um, uh, this is uh, one of these little jewels being spilled <laughs> from, from Adam's book. Um, Adam recounts an anecdote uh, in, in his prologue um, 
when, when Dario met for the first time Paul Velan, the French poet he admired, and Dario showed his appreciation for the beauty of his poetry, which had brought him fame. And um, Paul uh, responded something like, Glock, Glock, Merkt, fame, fame, shit, you know. Is this anecdote, do you think this anecdote can help us in any way to illustrate or help to un help us to understand the relationship of Dario's poetry with the French poetry he admired? Carlos. Yeah, certainly. I think on the one hand, it's a very anticlimactic moment for him um, who had adored French writers and, and, and French poets, and particularly Verlaine. Um, and then when he finally meets him, um, Berlin is toward the end of his life, completely drunk, um, just going from one pension to the other, living in hospitals. And, and he finds this um, completely the contrary of solemn character of a poet. Um, but on the other hand, I think it, it does illustrate how French literature and, and particularly French poetry at the time is a model for Dario. Um, this has been discussed widely when, when when you broach the the influences of Dario, but I think that um, he engages in a much more active way with French writers than is usually than he's usually given credit for. Um, mm -hmm. And what's what's fantastic about the way that he reads all these French poets, Hugo, Verlaine, um, Bonville, Le Comte de Lille, etc., is that he really wants to be read on a par with these French writers. Um, and really lift literature in Spanish at the level, on the same level as, as French literature at the time. Fantastic. Um, I, I believe that now Maria is going to read De Invierno. Uh, Adam, would you like to say something? Why have you chosen now to have De Invierno? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful poem. It's influenced by the French by Berlin, you could argue, by uh, Gautier, Théophile Gautier. Um, and uh, kept the rhyme as always, it was essential to keep the rhyme in this part. Uh, Verlaine was this great hero of, uh, of, of Darius, who we met and uh, was very disillusioned when he met him in Paris. Uh, but uh, what, what, um, what Dario liked about Verlaine was his ambiguity, his ambivalence, his, his uh, complexity. And um, we're going to read this, this, this poem, uh, De Invierno, because it captures the simplicity, the tenderness of Dario's poetry. Something that people don't talk about a lot. They don't talk about his humor, and they also don't talk about the tenderness. They get bogged down in the imagery. And the, it, the simple tenderness that Dario could depict in a line. And you'll see when we read this poem. Thank you. Bien. Adelante, María. Gracias, Antonio. De invierno. En invernales horas, mirad a Carolina. Medio apelotonada descansa en el sillón, envuelta con su abrigo de Marta Cibelina y no lejos del fuego que brilla en el salón. El fino angora blanco junto a ella se reclina, rozando con su hocico la falda de Alonso, no lejos de las jarras de porcelana china que medio oculta un biombo de seda del Japón. Con sus sutiles filtros la invade un dulce sueño. Entro sin hacer ruido, dejo mi abrigo gris, voy a besar su rostro rosado y halagüeño como una rosa roja que fuera flor de lis. Abre los ojos, mírame con su mirar risueño, y en tanto cae la nieve del cielo de París. In winter, in the long winter hours, gaze on Carolina. There she sits, curled up in her chair, wrapped in her brown sable coat. Have you seen her warming herself by the living room fire? The white nose of the fine Angora rug beside her nestles snug in her skirt of Alençon lace, not far from the vases of porcelain china, half hidden by Japanese silk 
tombstones. Her face is softened by sleep's sweet invasion. I enter in silence, remove my gray coat and kiss her face, all pink persuasion, like a red rose, which used to be an iris. She opens her eyes with a smile that provokes and outside it's snowing again in Paris. Um, we are approaching to the end of the questions. I, I have one question uh, that I'd like Adam and Carlos um, to answer, please. Uh, Darius influences uh, from uh, the French Parnassian, the symbolist, Baudelaire, Gerard, uh, Neval, etc. These influences have been widely described and discussed, yet Ruben Darío at the same time is recognized as a highly original poet. Is there a contradiction here? How do you explain this apparent inconsistency of being heavily influenced by these French writers and at the same time being highly original? Um, Adam and Carlos, briefly. Very briefly, I will say, uh, yes, as Carlos quite rightly said, that you had many enemies, a lot of them called Dario Afrancesado, and they used that in a, in a derogatory term, Frenchified, meaning over influenced by French poetry uh, to the detriment of Latin American poetry. Uh, Dario, well, I won't, I, I can imagine the kind of words he used, but I won't use them on, on, on air publicly because he thought that was absolute rubbish. He thought French poetry enriched Latin American poetry. You, you take the best of French poetry and you enrich it. You enrich your own culture. He couldn't understand the critics. He just could not understand the critics at all. There's no contradiction in his, in his mind, you know, between uh, uh, using French images and adopting them or adapting them to uh, his own idiom. And of course, as I said before, he used new meters. Part of the French, the symbolists and the, and the, the, the French poets that he loved, they were revolutionaries themselves in their use of meter. He was very attracted to that. But at the same time, he knew that he had to bring a, a different voice, another voice, a second Dario, a different Dario, which is the colloquial voice, the voice which long, long before Nicanor Parra, for example, in, in Chile, brought out his poemas, anti-poemas in 1954, Dario was doing colloquial, man in the street. So he could do high, he could do low. It makes no sense to make this schism. It doesn't make any sense. It's a false schism, a false division. Sorry, Thank Carlos. You. Yeah, yeah. Just to add to, to briefly add to that, I think um, I think it's an excellent question, and I completely agree with what Adam said right now. I think mean, Darío had a theory of originality that actually likens him to Borges and puts him years ahead of his time. Um, whereby what makes you original is the way in the way in which you imitate, um, not creating something ex nihilo or out or from scratch. Um, Borges then has that very wry phrase that he says, you know, when I was young and I used to believe in innovation, as if it's this article of faith, that he already discusses at the time with a Franco-Argentine writer called Grusac, um, and uh, about how his French influences actually make him original as opposed to kind of debase him as a writer. Um, and it's, I think in relation to that, that Ben Borges calls him the liberator. Um, because he also frees kind of those kind of literary, very narrow-minded constraints regarding what imitation or what a Spanish-American writer should look like or should do at the time. Um, he opens, I think, those doors as well. Wonderful. In this um, vein, I think uh, Maria is going to read now Metempsychosis. Uh, perhaps Adam wants to say something briefly before? I don't want to hold things up. I, 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 time... When you talk about that, your time flows, flies away. That, that's what that does to you, what a great poet he is. But Metensi, of course, is what Borges' his favorite poem of Darius. Uh, it's a fantasy, it's an invention. He invents, Darius invents a character, 
a Roman soldier. He invents a script, basically. It's it's almost it's almost unique. It certainly was when he wrote it. Unique in Spanish language. It's it's funny. It's lyrical. It's very very sexy. <laughs> very very sensual. Okay. In fact, there's a word I just very quickly. I must pick up one word. Um, the word the the uh, before we go on because it's going back to the uh, problem of translation. Um, in uh, this poem, one one uh, the, the poem is uh, was published in a Spanish edition, and a, a secondly, uh, and they changed a word in, in the line in Cuello de la Blanca Reina in Brahma. In Brahma means rotting, it means uh, on heat. When the poem was published in Spanish paper, they, they couldn't accept that. It was too early, it was still too early to in this kind of image, so they changed it to La Blanca Reina in Broma mm. as a joke. <laughs> um, I have just definitely decided to reject that Spanish version because it doesn't fit in with the highly erotic central theme of the whole poem. So anyway, without more ado, let's read. Excellent. The Thank you. Maria. <laughs> Adelante. Yo fui soldado que durmió en el lecho de Cleopatra, la reina su blancura y su mirada astral y omnipotente. Eso fue todo. Oh mirada, oh blancura, y oh aquel lecho en que estaba radiante la blancura, oh la rosa marmoria omnipotente. Eso fue todo. Y crujió su espinazo por mi brazo, y yo, liberto, hice olvidar a Antonio. O oh, el lecho y la mirada y la blancura. Eso fue todo. Yo, Rufo Galo, fui soldado y sangre tuve de Galia. Y la imperial Becerra me dio un minuto audaz de su capricho. Eso fue todo. ¿Por qué en aquel espasmo las tenazas de mis dedos de bronce no apretaron el cuello de la blanca reina en brama? Eso fue todo. Yo fui llevado a Egipto. La cadena tuve al pescuezo. Fui comido un día por los perros. Mi nombre, Rufo Galo. Eso fue todo. Metampsychosis. I was just a soldier who slept in Queen Cleopatra's bed, her pale skin and our all-powerful astral gaze, that was all. Oh, that look, that white skin, that bed where her pale body dazzled, oh, that all-conquering rose, that was all. Her black backbone heaved under the weight of my arms, and I, a freed slave, made her forget Antony. Oh, that bed, that look, that pale skin, that was all. I, Rufus Gallus, was a soldier. My hot blood came from Gaul, and then she, the imperial bull calf, granted me one moment of audacious caprice. That was all. Why, in my spasm, did I not squeeze the white neck of that rotting queen between my pincer-like fingers of bronze? That was all. I was taken to Egypt. My own neck was chained, and one day, I was eaten by dogs. My name is Rufus Gallus, and that is all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think uh, that's going to be all from, from me in terms of uh, questions. I think it's time to, uh, to move to our next um, part of the event, which is the few more poems read by Maria and Adam. I don't know, Maria and Adam, uh, which ones you're going to read because, you know, we, we need also to leave some time for the members of the audience to ask a few questions. So um, I'll let you decide uh, according to, you know, your preference, which ones you're going to start reading um, now. Maria, Adam. Adam, what would yeah. you say? 
What do you think? Well, shall we uh, go straight to... Um, how many, how many time, Antonio, do we have left? I would, I would say Margarita yes. and Lo Fatal, but I don't know if you want one more. Well, yeah, the two others are very short, Antonio. They're very, they're four lines. So I think we can have those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Margarita, and then Dale Asilo, Autorretrato, and Lo Fatal. Okay, that should, we should be okay for time. Can you repeat that, Adam? I couldn't hear you properly. Margarita first, yes, yes. Ma Margarita first? Yes. Okay. Margarita, entonces. ¿Recuerdas que quería ser una Margarita Gautier? Fijo en mi mente tu extraño rostro está. Cuando cenamos juntos en la primera cita en una noche alegre que nunca volverá. Tus labios escarlatas de púrpura maldita sorbían el champaña del fino bacagat. Tus dedos deshojaban la blanca margarita. Sí, no, sí, no. Y sabías que te adoraba ya. Después, oh flor de histeria, llorabas y reías. Tus besos y tus lágrimas tuve en mi boca yo. Tus risas, tus fragancias, tus quejas eran mías. Y en una tarde triste de los más dulces días, la muerte, la celosa, por ver si me querías, como a una margarita de amor, te deshojó. Margarita. Do you remember how you wanted to be another Marguerite Gautier? I can still see your strange face that first night as we sat down to eat. That happy night has vanished without trace. Your scarlet lips, no purple, drove me crazy as I sucked the champagne from the slender decanter. And all the while your fingers denuded the white daisy. Yes, no. You knew I loved you, my enchantress. And then the hysteria, you laughed and you wept. I swallowed you whole, your kisses and tears, your laughter, your perfume, your moans were all mine. Then one bleak evening, as the sweet day was dying, death in her jealousy, needing a sign that you really loved me, stripped you. Perfect. And then which one? Dale Asilo. Dale Asilo, perfecto. Me encanta este poema. Dar posada al peregrino. Aún no di posada ayer, y hoy prosiguió su camino llevándose a mi mujer. I should take in a poor traveler, you say? I did just that two days ago. He continued on his journey today, taking my wife along in tow. Ahora, autorretrato. Autorretrato is, is too short, too. <clears throat> Autorretrato a su hermana Lola. Este viajero que ves es tu hermano errante, pues aún suspira y aún existe, no como le conociste, sino como ahora es, viejo, feo, gordo y triste. Self-portrait for his sister Lola. Who is this traveler? Can't you guess? He's your world-weary wandering brother. Yes, still alive and kicking. Tell me you're glad. Mind you, it must be said he's, he's not the young lad you knew. These days he's far from his best. He's ugly, fat, and incredibly sad. Now to finish, I think Dario's most famous poem. 
lo, lo fatal. <coughs> Lo fatal. Dichoso el árbol que es apenas sensitivo y más la piedra dura porque esa ya no siente. Pues no hay dolor más grande que el dolor de ser vivo ni mayor pesadumbre que la vida consciente. Ser y no saber nada y ser sin rumbo cierto y el temor de haber sido y un futuro terror, y el espanto seguro de estar mañana muerto, y sufrir por la vida y por la sombra y por lo que no conocemos y apenas sospechamos, y la carne que tienta con sus frescos racimos, y la tumba que aguarda con sus fúnebres ramos, y no saber a dónde vamos ni de dónde venimos. Our mortality. Happy the tree that scarcely feels. Happier still the hard stone with no sense. The pain of living is all too real. The greatest sorrow is mortal conscience. To be, to know nothing on an aimless path. The fear of having been and the terror to come the certain horror of tomorrow's death, to suffer from life, from darkness, and from what we cannot know, though we have our doubts, from cool clusters of flesh that always tempt, and the tomb that waits with its somber boughs, unsure where we're going, where we're from, where we went. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I think it's time now to leave um, uh, to leave Pedro. I think Pedro is leading the questions and answers uh, a part of the event. Is that correct, Pedro? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. All yours thank now. You. Thank you very much, Antonio. It was really great. And now we have some questions from the public. Uh, the first question is from um, Maria, and she asks uh, to Adam, what were your criteria for selecting the poems uh, included? Uh, be included, I suppose, in the, yes, in the book. Which question is that? I'm, I'm looking at the list now. Yes. What what were the criteria for selecting the poems? Oh, for yeah. Oh, wow. What a question. I I could have, uh, of course, included twice as many. Yeah. Uh, but we wanted to make the length a reasonable one, not to make it too unmanageable. I wanted to give a, um, a, a rich mixture of the contradictions I was talking about before, so the for the the, uh, the lyrical poems that everyone turns to or thinks of Dario first of all, uh, the love poetry, but I also of course include the political poetry. His Ode to Roosevelt is one of the very first uh, political, social poems uh, to attack, the uh, anti-imperialist poem, of course. Um, so I include that, and then I include, as we've seen, the other voice, or one of the many other Dario voices, which is the colloquial, the man in the street, talking to the reader as if he knows him, talking about uh, some of the themes that are universal, but in, but in a down-to-earth way, fear of death, fear of the passage of time, um, all the things that we all worry about but talk, talking in this uh, very down-to-earth, as I say, colloquial conversational way, which, poem, which poets that came after him uh, have either to, you know, either they've seized on that or, the, or they prefer the other, another of the Darios, so people like Roberto Fernández Retamar in, in Cuba say that that colloquial voice is the one. So I've, I've tried to keep uh, a mixture of everyone without burdening the reader with too many poems, 
have also, of course, had an introduction to try and put it in context. Uh, but it was very difficult. The criteria, yeah, I, 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 always music, always, always music, always musical poems, always music, always the, some that rhyme. I have to stress that some don't rhyme in this book. So I want to show that Dario could do free verse just as well as anybody else. So I hope I've got, I've captured a rich selection. I think uh, the critics so far uh, seem to, I hope, seem to agree, but uh, I hope the readers and the people who have come tonight will, will read and uh, agree with me that uh, it's a suitable selection, but that's up to them, of course. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we have another question for you and also for uh, any of the acts that Kai may give an answer. And uh, apart from Ruben Darío's immense legacy, what would you, in the thing you personally find out, find most, ins sorry, inspiring about his poetry? I think it's his op the optimism, the hope. That's a, and that's what in inspires me about his uh, personality as well. They're, they're one and the same. So Darío was a man, we didn't talk much, that much about his life, but he was, you know, he lost several children. Yes, who was a sad life, yeah. His first wife died, his first wife died after going in, in the hospital for a routine operation, after which he had a, a, a week of just an, a, an alcoholic uh, blur. He can't remember anything that week because he was in such deep mourning. Uh, his second wife uh, proved very difficult, I would argue. Um, and, um, and he himself died very young at 49. Of, al of alcohol poisoning, much too young. He had lots of blows in his life. He also suffered uh, uh, off and on from financial hardships, and yet he kept going. He kept, uh, there's one of his poems in my book is called uh, Salutacion al Optimista, uh, Dear Optimista, I mean, uh, greetings for an optimist. He called himself an optimist. Yeah, that's and that's... in one of the poems we didn't have time uh, time to read, Nocturno. Yeah, Nocturno. At the last, it's all about uh, Nocturno. Is a wonderful poem. He wrote two Nocturno, famous Nocturnos. The one we two were going to read and couldn't, unfortunately, for time. It's about his regrets, about the things he could have done and didn't do. And then in the end, the last strophe is mo is wonderful. It's about how I don't give up. I'm I'm not going to hide away from the world. I'm going to keep on plodding away. Keep on joining the world with all its pain, with all its sorrow, I am not giving up. And that's what I love about Dario's poetry, the hope, mingling with the despair. It, it, it makes him so special, so wonderfully uh, uh, alive today. Thank you, Adam. And what, what about, uh, Carlos, what do you think, what is most inspiring apart from the great poetry from, from uh, Ruben Dario? I, I completely agree with Adam. I think his, his, his poetry, all of his writing is very optimistic and very forward looking um, and full of hope as well. I think the book Canto de Villa Esperanza was very important for Spanish writers because of that. There was this kind of general cultural stagnation and, and kind of sense of despair after losing the colonies and that Io tries to uplift all of them there. Um, but on a personal level, what, what I found like more instructive of Dario um, is how to be a Spanish American writer in a time when, at a time when that was not clear, there was no answer to that. Um, how to be a Spanish American writer in the face of European literature, in the face of Spanish literature, in the face of US literature. And, and his answer to that is, is a very forceful answer. Um, and also one full of optimism. So that, for me, has been immensely important. Thank you. And uh, the last, uh, and it's not a question, it's just a mention from Richenda, from the public. She says that uh, maybe you can make uh, some comments about it. The last two lines of the Invierno resonate with Louis McKenna's poem in which the pink roses sit by the window beyond which snow falls. That's very true. Very true. I have no idea what Nice was influenced. The, the, the influence was there. When we talk about the influence of Dario, it was vast. 
we've mentioned the influence on, on Latin American poets, but we shouldn't ignore the fact that um, he had him, he, he influenced the boom, the so-called boom novelists. You know, you can't, I, I believe there's a, there's a, a lot of Dario in, for instance, in a novel by Gabriel, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez called La Increíble Triste Historia de la Candida y Rindira y su abuela de Salmada. There's a lot of Dario in that. There's a lot of Dario in um, Manuel Mujica Lainez Bormarzo. There's yeah. a, a, a hell of a lot of, novel, of, of Dario in that Donoso, Jose Donoso, the Chilean novelist, wonderful novel, Casa de Campo. Yes. Nobody, nobody escapes Dario, even though they think they are. Yes, and you mentioned very different authors because Jose Donoso, Bomarth, Mujica yeah. yeah. It, it's it's very very different and very uh, not only thematic but the 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 the, uh, the writing and everything. Yes, it's like a, a whole inspiration yeah. that uh, even nowadays we all are very influenced by Ruben Dario. Um, if uh, there is no more questions, I would like just to know uh, to to thank you you all, Adam, Maria, Steve, Serrano. Carlos Grinsby, Antonio Martin Arboleda, and of course, uh, Giselle Morales, ambassador from Nicaragua, for the, this opportunity, for the Instituto Cervantes. For us, it's an immense honor to, to have you all here. And uh, as you mentioned, Adam, uh, Ruben Dario was an optimist. And uh, I hope with this poetry session, we also broke we have brought to you some optimism in these times that are not so easy. So I give you the word now, uh, Giselle, maybe you might want to see something. Thank you very much. Gracias, Pedro. Gracias, Adam, Maria, Carlos, por mostrarnos a Darío en toda su complejidad, por regalarnos su música, su poesía. Now I'm going to try to say it in English because it's uh, um, thank you to all, to Antonio, to Adam, to Carlos, to Maria, to Pedro, to all of you, and to them for bringing Dario, his music, in a totality, in as a whole. Um, we 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 heard about his personality, um, his uh, but but the thing the theme that goes from his personal life to the poetry, to um, the influence after him is like they said, hope. And, and he reflects um, when Adam was describing him, I just only thought that's what a Nicaragua is. Was it, that's what Nicaragua is. That despite of all the difficulties that we can, be uh, passing now the few the past the few it will be in the future we are just ready to not give up and to continue struggling and to continue uh, creating and following the sun following the light opening spaces opening with an open mind and happy and actually really happy to be able to do so. So thank you to all for, for that. Um, that's all for me. <laughs> and we wait all of you, please, also for the other two events about Ruben Dario. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you.